Spookies, and welcome to Rick or Treat Horror Cast, hosted by yours, ghoulie, Ricky J. Duarte. My guest today is a horror aficionado through and through, and a body horror expert, to be more specific. It's fitting that she's on this episode, because while today's movie isn't necessarily body horror, it is a horror movie about bodies. Welcome to the show, Steph Marie Oberly. Hey, how's it going? Good. Welcome to the show. I'm really, really glad that you took the time to be here. I understand you had quite the night of traveling. Oh, sure did. Yeah, flights delayed and, and uh, oh my God, I'm, I'm really grateful to you for, for showing up. <laughs> Nothing like being uh, stranded in the middle of nowhere. I love it. <laughs> yeah, well, you made it back. Welcome back to New York. <laughs> uh, Steph and I have become friends over the last months uh, from social media. And then when I was at Connecticut Horror Fest in September, Steph happened to be there as well. And so we got to hang out and spend some time and do a little shopping at vendors together. And we had a really great time. It was really cool to meet you there. That was a fun time. Was that your first convention? That was my first convention. I've been like dying to go to conventions for a really long time, but I'm slowly easing my way into, you know, getting a little more social and going to more social events. And that was like a huge thing for me. And I had a, I had a great time. Um, I'm looking forward to going to more eventually. Yeah. I had a killer time too. Uh, it was my first convention as well. I've done New York comic con before, but this was my first specific to horror convention. And yeah, it was a great time. Met some really cool people, yourself included. And uh, so, well, listen, I've kind of gotten to know you, but my guests haven't. Tell me a little bit about your interest in horror. Maybe uh, what, what is the first horror film that you remember watching? Gosh, my the first horror film that I remember watching. So I grew up watching horror, like since I was a child. My I was raised by my grandparents and I had numerous babysitters that were my aunts when they were like teens. So they didn't give like any shits about how I what I was watching or anything. So they would be watching like Cujo or like Carrie or Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And they'd be like, oh, she's in the room. Cool. And I would just be taking it all in, but they didn't think about that. But I'd like to think it made me who I am now in a good way. Um <laughs> There's a lot of ways that that could have gone wrong and I'm happy it didn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but my, one of the most um, influential horror films for me was Carrie. Um, I, it was one of the very first movies I saw as a kid and also as, you know, a teen. And I, it, it completely affected me, especially, you know, with history of like, bullying and like stuff like that it like it was a it, I I related to her so much and that movie has impacted me so much and continues to do so and uh at Connecticut Horror Fest when I met PJ Souls that was like a huge that was a huge thing for me yeah um you see kind of in my background I have a my signed vinyl back there There it is oh that looks yeah. good too nice display yeah it's pretty sick that's <laughs> great I mean Carrie is such a I every time I watch it when they're dancing at prom, I just want it to end differently. And it's such a testament to yeah. filmmaking, to De Palma, to SpaceX of just, you root for this character, but we all know what's gonna happen. You know, before you watch know. the movie, you know? And so it it's just, it's such a heartbreaking film and actually really appropriate, kind of a similar tone to the film that we're talking about today, but we'll get to that later. We'll get to that later. You love <laughs> Body horror. Talk to me about that, because that's actually a subgenre that I haven't really explored a lot on my show yet. Oh, I love. I it is my favorite show, the sub subgenre of horror. Like it is the coolest, the coolest. Yeah, the coolest, <laughs> nastiest. 
<laughs> Long day. The coolest and nastiest thing in the world. I love watching um, filmmakers get really creative with their gore and get really like gross. I love, I love the feeling of getting grossed out. It's one of my favorite things. Um, I don't know why it's, it's not like, there's a lot of different opinions that people have about body, body horror. Like, um, a lot of people will think it's like, for example, like the hostile movies or like the human centipede movies, like things like that, where people will go into like, oh, this is absolute, like, like basically torture porn in a way. Like there's a lot of and while that is very true and it can seem that way, a lot of people watch it for the artistic elements that these films bring and um, the different uses that you can, you know, get out of prosthetics and gore and, you know, makeup. And I just, I love that stuff. I watch them for the artistic elements. It's just, it's so much fun to see what new things people can bring to the table and how different they can be. And that's, that's one of my favorite, it, it's, that's really why in a nutshell. Sure. It, um, it, uh, it, it's incredible to see how, like you said, how creative people can get with these kills or what can be done with the human body. You, I'm actually, I'm going to mention, cause you said hostile. I'm, I'm going to a screening of Thanksgiving today. And then I'm interviewing oh, Eli Roth. Fun. I'm interviewing Eli Roth tomorrow. Like, what what is happening so in my scary. life but back to body horror <laughs> uh, for me i've really i love the body horror i'm a big cronenberg fan like love him big mm -hmm. i i love his um kind of combination of the human body and technology and this evolution of combining the two you know um or i think my favorite cronenberg might be the brood actually i think it's uh it's a rough one to sit through it's very bizarre it's one of his earlier films do you have a favorite cronenberg oh i absolutely love scanners i oh, absolutely yeah. love uh videodrome i that goes into what i was saying with the um the makeup effects that he, that him and his team came up with like absolutely absurd stuff yeah. like so out of like out of pocket like random bizarre uncomfortable like really weird things and a, it just a vaginal deep. vcr slot like <laughs> oh my god forget about it absolutely ridiculous and genius and yeah. will continue to be iconic until the end of time like he's made some incredible incredible pictures kind of created a genre for himself as well. I was at a screening of Video Drum several months ago downtown, and I was really surprised at how many people in the audience had obviously never seen the film. And yeah. um, some of the special effects are maybe not as good as they could be by today's standards. And I actually found myself surprised at people laughing at some of these moments. But I think with Cronenberg, it really comes from a place of discomfort and trying to wrap your head around what you're looking at, which is actually when it comes to the movie that we're talking about today, where a lot of the humor I think comes from as well. But we're gonna get to that. I would love to know if you have consumed any horror recently that you wanna recommend to listeners. So books or movies, music, video games, board games, anything. Oh gosh. Um, I mean, I, I've been slowly working my way um, kind of back in time in a way. Um, and I've been catching up on things I've missed because I travel a lot and I miss a lot of new things. Um, I recently saw Cobweb. Nice. And I really liked that a lot. I thought that was a very interesting film. Like, I don't know if you saw that. I did. Yeah. I went Barbenheimer, Barbenheimer weekend. I didn't see Barbie. I didn't see, see Oppenheimer. I saw Cobweb. <laughs> you saw Cobweb and one of the two, or did you just see? Neither. No, I'm not a Barbie. I'm not an Oppenheimer. I am a Cobweb. <laughs> oh my gosh. I saw, I, I pretty sure. What did I see? I saw, um, oh, speaking of saw, I saw saw 10. That's yeah. Yeah, I did see that. Re I completely forgot. I did see that, that recently. I saw that on the opening day and I had a great time seeing that. Yeah, that you're a, a big Saw fan. I love it. That's it's once again, just the gross out stuff. I love it. But yeah, so Saw X was a lot of fun for sure. It. I think, have you seen, first of all, have you, how many of the Saw films have you seen? 
I've probably seen six out of 10. Okay, that's good enough. Like I would say, I would argue that Saw 10 was one of the best three. Sure. So far, like I think it was in the, I think it was in the top three of all of the 10. Okay. Like I would put it right after, right after like two. I think mm-hmm. two is my favorite one. And yeah. I think I would put it right after two and then saw the first one being the third. Like, I just thought it was really, it went back to its roots. Cause for a while it went kind of its own way. Crazy. Where, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, it was specifically for the kills and for the traps, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, that's fun. Um, but this one went back to like, it had an interesting plot. It had an interesting, like, it was just, it was very interesting. It went back to what, it used to be and yeah. i loved seeing it and it also gave a huge um like it was like the most dialogue and acting i think i've ever seen from tobin bell <laughs> like right. in any of the front and center so that was yeah. really fun that was really fun to watch yeah it was interesting to see a film focusing on him and he's such an he's a very incredible actor i did struggle with sympathizing him a bit uh, i think that over time the films have glorified him And while I love to root for a villain and I love to find reasons to struggle with liking a villain, at times I'm also like, fuck off. (laughs) Uh, But I did enjoy the film. I agree. I think that it- I killed anybody. Uh, Yeah, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I I enjoyed the film and I do think that it was a return to form and certainly uh, a better- installment than than a number of the more the more recent sequels for sure i uh, you know i i did watch five nights at freddy's and okay. that's all i'm going to say about it oh my gosh no uh, not a recommendation in the least could not no oh, uh, but no. i will recommend <laughs> go ahead I was I was gonna I was gonna catch that soon. I'm sad. That makes me sad. Well, you know, some people are enjoying it. I think uh, it it makes me furiously angry that it has made so much money in the box office. Damn. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, I'm not here to I'm not here to rag on things. I'm actually gonna make a recommendation for something that I did watch recently, uh, because the director of today's film, Lucky McKee, went on to make a film called The Woman. And I watched it this weekend at your behest. I kind of went on a Lucky McKee bender this weekend, but we'll get to that in a minute. The Woman is 2012, I believe. uh, And I- 2011, yes. 2011. This is a film that I don't want to give anything away. I really don't think you should watch a trailer for it. I think that this is a film to go in blind like I did. And it's been on my radar for a very long time. And people have warned me, like it's really messed up. It's really hard to sit through. And I thought I could take it. And let me fucking tell you, at the climax of this film, the biggest moment, the most shocking and upsetting like sequence, I felt physically ill and my stomach was in knots and I, I, I got nauseous. And that has probably, I can count on one hand how many times that's happened to me. I think in Gerald's game, when she tries to get out of the handcuffs and peels her skin, hand skin off, I had to turn that movie off and then come back to it five minutes later. And then Antichrist with the genital mutilation scene was another movie that I I had to turn that one off and walk around my apartment and kind of like shake my hands out and like shake it off before I could finish that movie. And the woman gave me another reaction similar. I didn't turn it off. I got through it. I think that it's very heavy handed, but I also think that I appreciate that it's heavy handed as a message it came out kind of actually right at the, the the peak of the Me Too movement. And I don't know if that was on purpose or not, but I think that uh, it does a lot and it's gonna beat you over the face with its message, but it's a message that you should probably get your face beaten in with, you know, some people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I did also find out, did you know it's a sequel? Yeah. Yeah, so I ended up watching Offspring it didn't grab me as much. I think that the woman works as its own film. I don't think that the offspring is necessary to understand or enjoy the woman because I didn't even know that it was a sequel. And then did you know that there is a sequel to the woman? Yep, darling. Which I started watching and I turned it off. I didn't need any more story. The ending of the woman was for me, the ending that felt appropriate. I didn't, the direction that darling was going was not grabbing me. I didn't need that. And I turned it off. I don't think that I'll finish it. 
it was it's it's a pretty oh it's a pretty okay standalone film um i have a appreciation for that trilogy as a whole um i read the books a long time ago by okay. jack ketchum mm-hmm. um the late genius jack ketchum um who uh stephen king uh once said is like the scariest person alive so like that's you know says something that's saying uh, something yeah <laughs> um i don't know did you ever see the girl next door yeah that was also him that was interesting one of his, okay yeah. wow which was that was also a heated film yeah that film was very very hard to watch yeah um but yeah wow. the woman stars you know the lead of the of the movie we're talking about, Angela Bettis. They've worked together several times. I will say one, one last thing about the woman. I don't normally give trigger warnings because different things trigger different people. But this yes. movie contains every trigger warning you can possibly imagine. And so it's a hard movie to say that I recommend because of its subject matter. It's a hard movie to say that I like because of its subject matter. But it is yeah. a experience maybe worth happening having for the right viewer. But... So, all right, we're talking Angela Bettis working with Lucky McKee, the director. I'm just going to spoil it. We're talking about May today, 2002, written and directed by Lucky McKee. Angela Bettis stars. He also starred in another film with him, Sick Girl, which is an installment on Masters of Horror, which is another one that I watched at your behest. And um, part of it worked for me, part of it didn't. I find it really interesting that he continues, like continuously writes lesbian relationships. Even in The Woman, there was a lesbian relationship that got cut out of the movie. Yeah, just doesn't happen. And uh, I, I'm really interested and curious about why he he does that. Uh, Sick Girl, for an hour-long episode, I think works. I think that's as long as it needed to be. What, what was your take on it? Let's make this a quick one, though, because we got to get to May. Yeah, oh yeah. It was a, I think it was a cute, quirky unserious horror film yeah. that did what it m- meant to do i don't think he wrote that to be a serious film it was i think it was um just really camp it, it you know it was meant to be you know kind of funny and it was on occasion yeah. there was a lot of comedy in there and um yeah i i i enjoyed it but it wasn't like a film with like a shit ton of substance it was you know it was just it is it's straightforward it is what it is i think that the show for me what did not work was that these these two women in a relationship could only find balance and happiness after they were impregnated by this in like penetrated and impregnated by this insect that's assumed but presumably a male and then they're happy in this heteronormative presenting over i mean how heteronormative is two pregnant members of a relationship. But you know what I mean? It was like, that was then their happy ending was like, we're pregnant, we're in a relationship and this is what happiness is. But on that token, the things that went wrong in that movie would not have happened if people were not homophobic. And I thought that that was an interesting take as well. True. I can see that. Yeah. But all right. So uh, enough with recommendations. Why don't we get into the movie? Let's go Rick or treating. So today we're talking May from 2002, as I mentioned, written and directed by Lucky McKee. Steph, you are kind of a a, a aficionado on this this soundtrack. Why don't you take it away? So the soundtrack, it's Jam's Luckett. So it's it's, uh, Jay Barnes Luckett, I believe is her name. Um, And she does a whole if you go on like her youtube it's a little it's pretty interesting she does a lot of like niche experimental music jams that are like kind of interesting to watch um and listen to um but her pretty much claim to fame is that soundtrack and it is super bizarre and weird and interesting and really makes a huge it, it adds so much to the film it like to like a point where it's scary how balanced it all is and it brings the story like so it it just it just meshes so well together it's like absolute genius and 
for someone that's like not really known at all, it's kind of sad. Um, uh, but she has, uh, a, a, uh, she has like two experiments, I want to say. Um, so she has the jams lucket thing. And then she also, uh, did this thing called poporatic, which, um, was used to score um sick girl from what i understand oh cool um so some of those tracks like th this whole group of people they collaborate so much mm -hmm. i don't know like if you watch one of these films and then you look at like the imdb and like go through um like all like a bunch of other films that lucky has done all this stuff is like it they all work together and it's really cute in a way it's like yeah. it's 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 like a cute collaboration. I, I love it. I love to see that when people continue to make art together and continue to, you know, create. I love that. Um, but yeah, the soundtrack is awesome. And I want to know what you thought about it. Like, it's just, it made such a huge difference. Like, I can't imagine the film without the soundtrack. You know what I mean? Or like if John Williams was to score it, like, right. it would be a little different. <laughs> I think uh, watching so I also watched the Lucky McKee movie All Cheerleaders Die last night as well. Oh, yeah. And that that one did not grab me, I got to say. But his film is punctuated by not just scores, but songs. He puts specifically yes. songs in his in his films. And I I appreciate that to a point. I thought that the songs in The Woman were incredibly distracting. And I have to wonder if it had a more traditional score during some of these upsetting moments, if it would have hit me a little harder uh like the score for the woman was done by uh sean spillane i believe mm -hmm. his name was yep and it was like every single one of the tracks was sung and written by him from what i understand and by themselves if you listen to the soundtrack it's a good soundtrack yes. it just doesn't the blending with the the content like you said is what makes it a little i don't know if it was what they were trying to do maybe to add like a lot of discomfort right in like every way shape and form um I, it worked for me okay um but it's it's interesting to hear your thoughts on you know that's that's a that's a cool take i think that lucky does not do things by accident and so i trust what yeah. his intention was behind it even if it didn't work for me or it distracted me i think that the movie has a reputation for a reason and i'm certain that the the choice of songs adds to it. When it comes to May, we have the Breeders as, uh, lending a lot of work to the soundtrack, multiple tracks. Uh, and then Breeders members, uh, Kelly and Kim Deal as well uh, in Kelly's separate project, the Kelly Deal 6000 uh, adds a couple of tracks. When He Calls Me Kitten has been, uh, it was on every playlist that I gave a boy I had a crush on between the years like 2002 and 2009. Like I love that song so much and uh i the the set this film lucky has said a lot of it takes inspiration from taxi driver starring robert de niro which i can totally see and inspired a lot by nirvana not just by their music but kind of by what they stood for a little bit of that like like post narcissism um feel to it and a lot of the music in this has kind of a latent grunge feel which I think gives it, it sets it in a time and place, but the look of this film feels timeless to me and yeah. creates a real tone to this movie. We also have music from H is Orange and Strangels and Tommy Jones and the Shondells, which uh, Lucky has said he has no idea how he got the rights to so much of this great music, but it all worked out really well. The film, this is a cool fact, when it comes to editing, uh, three editors are credited, Deborah Goldfield, Chris Siverston, and then... Ryan fucking Johnson, who directed Knives Out and Brick and Glass Onion and The Last Jedi, was an editor on this film before he made it big, which I think is cool. I also discovered he puts little um, Easter eggs about May in many of his films. In The Last Jedi, there's a character named Captain Kennedy, which is May's last name, May Kennedy. So he named yeah. a character in fucking Star Wars after May, which I think is really cool as a as a, <laughs> a may you know nerd i i love this film it is top 10 favorite horror films for me i'm gonna venture to say maybe top six i, I might put it in like the sixth position in my top 10 for sure i discovered Here. this movie 
Uh, well, let's get to that in a second. Costumes, really quick. Uh, Murano Diaz and Marcelo Pequeño did an incredible job. The textiles and prints in this movie are really gorgeous. They kind of, even wallpapers in this movie, there's so many patterns, which blends and ties to May's um, sewing, right? Yes. But gorgeous to look at. Those costume designers also designed the costume for Susie the doll. And so that ties everything together really well. Uh, when it comes to my relationship to this movie, it was on IFC channel a lot. When I was, if it was 2002, I would have been like 16, I think. And when I discovered this movie, so I was probably 16 or 17 when I found it. And I remember when IFC channel first like was a part of our home and it really blew my mind. This movie helped shape my understanding of what independent cinema is and shaped, I think me and my taste in film a lot because it's bleak and there's an open ending that's up for interpretation and you know it's not happy and everything does not turn out right and those are things that I actually really appreciate in film these days and I, I owe it all a lot to this movie actually I had seen this movie multiple times but had never seen like the first few minutes of it until I bought it on DVD a few years later so I had watched it from maybe 10 minutes in and I never actually saw the opening opening so seeing it in completion was a, a whole new experience for me as well. What is your relationship to May? Oh my goodness. I found it when I was in high school and I um, immediately, immediately was like hooked on it. I thought it was one of the smartest, most like incredible pieces I've seen in a very long time. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure I found it while snooping on Anna Ferris's IMDb. Okay. Pretty sure that's how, cause I had, I huge scary movie fan, yeah. but <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure I found it through that. And I, I was like intrigued by the um, poster art. Sure. And I think that's how I, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to check this out. And I sat there and I watched the whole thing and I thought it was like, I was, I was just, my jaw was on the floor the whole time. Like, absolute beautiful heartbreaking cinema like yeah and for such a low budget it's like insane it didn't do super well and it was marketed in my opinion poorly i actually showed the trailer to my friend last night and the trailer is a disaster the trailer is god awful it like starts out as the tricking you into thinking it's a romantic comedy and then it takes a turn and suddenly it's a horror movie but it's marketed as a slasher film which it is not I think not. not even in the little bit, even the, the climax of it to me doesn't feel like a slasher at all. And right. it, just people didn't know what to make of it. And that's all that there is to it. Critics really enjoyed it for the most part. Roger Ebert even said uh, something to the effect of, I'm, I'm always interested in Roger Ebert's reviews because he's kind of that, that era of like cis white man watching a movie. And it's fascinating to me what <laughs> what that opinion is when it's so wrong so often. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't think that he was wrong about every movie that he ever reviewed, but when it comes to his views on horror, I think it's yes. fascinating what he had to say, but he loved this film. And he said that the ending would have looked silly in any other movie, but this ending, like, the, it works for it and it deserves this ending and it makes sense and it's heartbreaking. And he, you know, I, I find it interesting that he appreciated this one because it seems like something that he never would have. Uh, the film right. has found love and a home in the horror community. It's a film where if it, horror fans know it and the ones who know it tend to love it. I don't think I've ever met anyone who has seen this movie who did not like it, uh, though I'm sure that they exist. And I just think for a certain kind of person and a certain kind of horror fan, it like strikes a chord of being lonely and feeling isolated and feeling weird. You know, I at the risk of scaring away any potential boyfriend who might listen to this episode, I relate a lot to May, or I have at times in my life, right? This kind of overexcited feeling when she meets someone and really longing to meet someone and to be seen is something that I think everyone can relate to at one point in their life or another. And I think that this film, Absolutely. I appreciate that it takes its time. Nothing grotesque, truly grotesque happens until about 50 minutes into this movie. We get to know this character pretty intimately. And that's what I really respect about it. 
Yeah. No, she, um, she's a heartbreaking character and someone that I too related to a lot. Um, that anxiety, that, that one scene where she's waiting at the phone yeah, and wondering if she should call Adam and yeah. then like leaves a really messy voicemail. That- <laughs> it's so hard to watch. Even the camera pans like, away. Even the camera can't look at her. I think, like, oh God. I think that's a tie to Taxi Driver. When Tavis calls her, he knows he's fucked up on their date, right? When he takes her to the porn theater. Yeah. He calls her and it's this long, weird conversation and the camera just pans away because it's too hard to watch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, oh no, I've definitely left a voicemail like that to like many women. So like, I, I get that. I yeah. get that. Completely. And if it were made now, it would be texting and then she would send it and immediately regret it and then she would send a million more texts and she would be unsending not knowing that that actually doesn't it just clears it on your end not right. on yours <laughs> yeah yeah god damn it it's rough Ugh. uh all right so the the film you know what we're talking about her as a character let's talk about her as an actor angela bettis plays may oh. dove kennedy and i i struggle to think that this film would work as well as it does without her i think that her in this role is a revelation I think that she gives a performance that should be ridiculous and gives it so much texture and so much emotion. And you just want, you just want to protect her and you want to, you want her to be happy. You want her to find happiness and God damn it. She doesn't. (laughs) Doesn't happen. Uh, There are some directions where it almost goes that way and could have gone that way potentially, but you know, like she's out there. She's very out there and it scared the few people that, you know, were open to it. Like Adam, even like looking at his apartment, it's like, Oh, Oh God. Okay. Yeah. No, this is a good match. Right. Right. <laughs> but I don't know if you noticed like the scenery in the back of his apartment. Oh, I did. Like, it's, it's, um, yeah. yeah. So like you almost thought you almost think like they set it up to think that maybe, oh, this is gonna work out and she's gonna be happy and this is gonna be a different ending. And no, it completely completely throws you for a loop there and yeah. uh yeah. breaks your heart a million pieces. She they auditioned about a hundred women to play May, and Lucky said that when he found her, uh I believe the audition scene was when they're sitting in the car uh eating yes. chips and salsa. I believe that was the audition scene. And he mentioned that she was like too good. Like at the audition, he couldn't give her any direction because she was, she had filled it with so much emotion just on an, an, an initial test screen, you know, that there was no choice. There was no other option. And it really, I mean, they collaborated so many times over the years after this. And I, I also wonder how much of herself was put into this character, you know, as far as the design of the character, I would be really curious with this film to see how like earlier drafts, because I think that right. it, what we see on the screen is a masterpiece, but I'm curious what, like where it started. Lucky mentioned that without Amanda Plummer's character in the movie, The Fisher King, May would not have happened. And I don't know if you've seen that wow. movie or not with Robin Williams, but she plays, there's this really Very gorgeous, long Gorgeous, if not saccharine scene where Robin Williams and Amanda Plummer finish a date and she gets really emotional and she basically describes the entire relationship that's going to happen and how it's going to end in tears. And it's, it's she delivers it perfectly. And they're not the same character, wow. but I see the relationship between May and Amanda Plummer's character in that film. Uh, we also have Jeremy Sisto as at <laughs> Adam's mm-hmm. last name is Stubbs, which... When you see what happens to him in the end of this movie, it's a fucking hilarious <laughs> joke. Uh, Jeremy Sisto is known for being in Clueless. He's great in that. Uh, he was in Wrong Turn. And did you know he was uh, up for the role of Jack in Titanic? That I have not. So it was backstage. That's interesting. Did this article where it was like, this is what happens when a very good actor is just not right for the role. And it was supposed to encourage actors to be like, you can be very talented and just not be the right fit. And so it's him with Kate Winslet, they're costumed, they're doing a scene together. And it's just very clear knowing the movie Titanic, like 
yeah, he's not the right one. He's not Jack. You know, he had a little more confidence. He had a little more, um, it, it, a little more, um, it's just not right. And, but I think that Jeremy Sisto is kind of an underrated actor. I think he's on a show called FBI right now. Like he still looks great. He's still going. All right. We also have Anna Ferris. So she had made scary movie and I believe she had already done scary movie two as well, or it came out around the same time as this. I as, think they got her right when she was about to be popular. Yeah, exactly. And she there yet. plays Polly. Anna Ferris is on a different planet in this movie. <laughs> and she's so fucking good. No one could have played this role but her. She, she just brings this bizarre, sexy, fucked up humor to this movie that the movie desperately needs you know She's especially the lesbian that i want to be great the lesbian that you want to be <laughs> god damn is she good in this movie um i she is an actor there's just an indescribable I, I can't describe it i don't know what it is about her she she's unlike anyone else there's no other anna ferris type you know enough said with the thumb sucking scene enough said seriously <laughs> legit uh james duvall plays blank who he's only in like one scene but he's notable from donnie darko he was in independence day and then we have nicole hiltz as ambrosia which is such a stupid name that's a fucking salad (laughs) all right why don't we get into the plot of this movie not a salad not a salad (laughs) not (laughs) in front of my salad (laughs) what's a salad all right okay so we open with uh, stitching on patches of red and yellow fabric, and then the title card, May, appears, and a little blood stain begins to seep through this fabric. We cut to May looking in a mirror, and she's got her hand over her bloody eye, and she's screaming, 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 and it's this jilting start to the film. You've got red and, red and yellow fabric, which are technically considered the happiest two colors. That's why it's the McDonald's colors. And then we cut to this fucked up scene of someone with a a bloody eye and she's just screaming in agony. And then that's it. We then cut to May's childhood. (laughs) So we already know that the Stuart Move film's headed in a weird direction. Uh, Doll parts kind of fall above, you know, in front of the screen and young May asks her mom, what's wrong with my eye? And her mom says, the doctor says it's lazy, but we're going to make you perfect. And then more doll farts doll farts then more doll parts fall in front of the screen and uh, we see may at a park and now she's wearing an eye patch she says it itches and her mom tells her if she wants to make any friends she has to keep it covered and she covers the eye patch with may's hair but may doesn't want that and she uncovers it and then this little boy comes and asks her if she's a pirate and she shakes her head and then the kids all just walk away from her and then she covers the eye patch again with her hair more doll parts fall and now it's may's birthday and she's blowing out candles on a cake and her mother tells her i've always said if you can't find a friend make one and gives her a present and may begins to unwrap it and she's tearing the paper and her mom instantly is displeased and says now it's ruined which like what did you expect her to do with a fucking present but anyway May's gift is a porcelain doll in a red dress. There's kind of crude stitching, piecing this dress together. And the doll is in a glass case. Her mom tells her her doll's name is Susie. And Susie was the first doll that she ever made. She was her best friend. And now she'll be yours. May tries to open the case. And her mom says, no, you can't take her out. She's special. Then we cut to young May asking Susie what she thinks of her eye patch. So this whole opening sequence was supposed to be about 15 minutes long. And it, it, it comes down to about three minutes just to get more to the point. But how, what, what is your read on May's childhood? Once the mother or any mother in general utters the word perfect. Yeah. To a kid. They fucked up. Sure. That's all I've got to say. Coming from personal experience, um, I was raised by someone who used the word perfect a lot and it messed me up. It gave me, you know, I had a eating disorder for a really long time. It fucked me up. Um, I just think that that's a word that you should never say when talking about a child's appearance Mm -hmm. or anyone's appearance, to be honest. I just think it's, a very slippery slope and it's dangerous and you know a child's mind is so easily warped and it's like a sponge you know you like 
it's, it's just, it was asking for, like, I just thought once that, once she said that, I was like, oh, that was, that was, that's a problem. And then seeing the birthday party with like the unwrapping of the gift and the, how she was so like, it's, and then you see the dad kind of rolling his eyes too. Yeah. For a second. yeah. Like, it's like, oh no, this mother is, she's, she's one of those. Yes. And that's already like, that's a hard watch, you know, cause you know, been there and it's like, it made me understand the character a lot more and it made me less um, surprised that she ended up with so many problems. Yeah. Um, this movie, I would love to just talk about, and we, why don't we keep this conversation going as we talk about the film, Nature absolutely. versus uh, Nature versus Nurture. There was a moment when I was a little concerned that May is a depiction of someone who is neurodivergent. And I've come to my personal conclusion that she's not. Uh, but I'm certainly not an expert on neurodivergence. I don't think that this film is intending to caricaturize or or even represent someone who's neurodivergent. I think that May is someone who sees the world in a different way than other people. But I, I just want to say that up front, like I'm not going to go down that path and try to relate it to that at all. When it comes to nature versus nurture, I think it might be a blend of both. I think that she has trouble. She's lonely and isolated, but I certainly think that her mother did did not help in that at all. She made it completely worse. Absolutely not. I just I just think that that was a huge, that's a huge issue, and it's a bigger conversation, honestly, for parents now. Like any parent, honestly, yeah. like that's just not the that's not the route to go down. Yeah, not at all. Well, we cut to adult May and she is sewing and she's talking to Susie, this doll. Now it's really fascinating and we're gonna, we'll get into what the, the doll means to both of us as we go along. But like this friend that she's had since a child is a doll named Susie behind glass. Never touched this doll, never opened this doll, representing perhaps what May feels is wrong with her, right? Uh, and, right. and unable to get to it, unable to touch it. Uh, she tells Susie that she saw someone today, a boy. And then we cut to who will turn out to be Adam caressing a car. And we get a real close up of his hands. And May tells Susie, you know how you see someone and you think you'll like them, but the more you look at them, you see parts you don't like, like that guy on the bench. And we cut to May on a bus bench sitting next to a guy. She takes off her glasses and it reveals that one of her eyes is extremely lazy. Her right eye is very lazy. And that's why she wore an eye patch when she was a little girl. And the man doesn't even notice her. And he gets up and walks away. And she she looks a little dejected. Uh, and then she says, and sometimes you don't end up liking any parts at all. And May tells Susie that she likes every part of this new boy that she saw today, especially his hands. They're beautiful. She tells Susie, don't be mad. You've been my friend my whole life. And you see me. You always have. But I need a real friend. I need someone I can hold. We cut to the doctor's office. Lucky McKee's dad plays the optometrist in this scene. BTW. Very true. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> May is being fitted for contacts. The doctor assures her that the contacts are going to correct her lazy eye, going to draw it forward, just like her glasses do. Uh, your good eye just needs a little help. And she remarks, I need all the help I can get. And we get this real sense. Angela Bettis speaks in a very light, delicate tone. Uh, shy at all times, very unsure of herself, but she's excited because she remarks that Friday she has a date. She says, this boy is perfect. And we instantly cut to May eating chili dogs, <laughs> which is a bold <laughs> choice for lunch <laughs> outside, outdoors. And she's wearing uh, cardboard glasses because her eyes have been dilated, right? The big giant glasses mm -hmm. that an optometrist would give you. And she right. sees Adam, who's, you know, the hot guy with the good hands. He's a mechanic. Uh, and he's across the street having a cigarette and she's just watching him. Cut to May's job. She works at a uh, Sarkeesian Animal Hospital and she's a vet tech. And here's where we meet Polly, Anna Ferris. And this whole opening, I'd say the first 10 minutes goes by real fast. It's a lot of short sure sequences, does. almost a montage. Uh, this might be where the movie catches up with itself. And uh, Anna Ferris, <laughs> she's so, I don't want to say dumb, but I don't want to say ditzy. I think that she knows what she, I know. She knows what's up. Kooky. She, kooky. Uh, she says, "What is it? What the hell is a scoople?" <laughs> and May instantly knows it's a scalpel. And 
we we discover that the doctor is perhaps Russian and speaks with a very thick accent and Anna Ferris just can't understand what he says, or maybe she can, but she's racist and thinks that she's being funny. It's unclear. Yeah. This is what I like about every character, but May is that we can't figure them out because May can't figure them out. Right. Uh, is Polly a good or bad person? Is May a good or bad, I'm sorry. Is Adam a good or bad person? We don't know. They, it, it can be read either way. I listened to a couple of different podcasts talking about this movie and like one of them hosted by two gay men called Adam a total fuck boy. Whereas another one hosted by a straight couple did not. And they thought that his intentions were good at first. And it, you know, it's just, it, this movie can be read in such a personal way by every different person. And I think yeah. that it speaks volumes of what it is. I feel like everybody in some way, shape, or form has had experiences close to what May has experienced. Yes. Like, so I feel like there's so many different ways to take what is happening in her adult life. There are so many different routes that, you know, you can see it, so many different views. And it's, that's, that's a fun part of the conversation. Like you could talk to so many people that have seen it and it's always a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. So outside of the animal hospital, Polly is carving a pumpkin. This is going to set us in a time frame. It's Halloween time. I My guess is this is about the beginning of October. And Polly asks May what she's going to be for Halloween. And instead of responding to that, May tells her that she has a beautiful neck. And Polly <laughs> is delighted by this. And she thanks her. And she tells May she should call her some night. They'll hang out and eat some melons some or melons. something. <laughs> Which is such a weird <laughs> fucking thing to say. And Anna Ferris's <laughs> delivery just makes it like, what the fuck is she talking about melons? It's you know what, Lesbians know what she means by melons. Lesbians, lesbians know, know what she means. This is a flirty- Let's be honest, we know. Let's be honest. This you is know. a flirty <laughs> interaction. And it's flirty on Polly's behalf. May, I don't think, picks up on the flirt immediately, but she does seem excited that someone wants her to call her and hang out. Uh, we cut to May yeah. in the elevator of her building and this couple is making out hardcore in the elevator and May is kind of shoved off in the corner awkwardly. The male in this is Lucky McKee. Yeah, I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The the, the male uh, making out with a woman is, is Lucky McKee. And yep. they look at her in the corner. She's still wearing the giant cardboard glasses and they look annoyed that she's even there. Like they hadn't noticed her before. And then they're like, what the hell are you doing here? And then they just go back to kissing. But it's kind of like, you know, they didn't notice that she was there. Nobody sees May. She's very easily missed, right? She's very slight. She's very small, very thin and um, timid. You know, I think mm -hmm. I want to use the word stunted when it comes to May and her personality. I think that yeah. over at, at some point in her childhood, she stopped developing uh, social cues and knowing how to interact with others. I still blame the mom. Completely. Uh, so May is struggling to get her new contacts in at first. And we see that her apartment is filled with dolls on shelves. I mean, this is like too many My dolls. worst nightmare. Seriously. My worst fucking nightmare. Seriously. I think I'm at an age May at about 22 years old, I think. Because if she's a vet tech, that's a two-year degree. I that think, works. Yeah, maybe 22. She's too old to have this many dolls around her house. Uh, but when she finally gets her contacts and she's super excited because she's never seen her face and her eyes pointing forward without glasses, uh, we see Susie, right. the doll, and she, there's a, now a crack on the corner of the glass of her case. And May kind of walks over with her hair in her face and then reveals her new eyes, her new look to Susie. We cut to May crossing the street as Adam is approaching from the other side. And it looks like she's been waiting for him to walk this way. Maybe a little bit like just watching him trying to time this out. And right when she's about to say something as they cross the street, he turns to light a cigarette and she's taken aback and she just keeps walking awkwardly. And then at the animal hospital, yep. we get this story from this pet owner and he's talking to Anna Ferris, who Anna Ferris is the receptionist of the animal hospital, BTW. And he's talking about when he left for vacation, he had his dog had four legs. And now she only has three and he's crying. <laughs> he's crying and he says, I've looked everywhere and I can't find her leg. And Polly is shocked. And her like facial expression, like her mouth wide open, like she doesn't know what to do with this information. She has May come over to handle the situation and she walks away. I love the guy says, I got a dog that's missing a leg here. 
I mean, I throw a stick and nothing happens. Nothing happens. <laughs> this humor is so bizarre because you don't know if you're supposed to laugh at these yeah. things. And I think that oh. these, these comedic moments where you don't know if you're supposed to laugh then blend with horrific moments where you don't know if you're supposed to laugh. I feel that in life in general, like there are so many moments in life where like sometimes you laugh because that's all you know how to do. Like that's what you, what your body feels. Yeah. It needs to do or else you'll cry or something. Yeah. Like, it's, it, yeah. Yeah. I always oh, say horror God. and comedy are two sides of the uh, same coin because they both give you a reaction that you're not, that you have no control over, right? Laughter Absolutely or not. a shriek. <laughs> Uh, so now May's getting dressed in front of her mirror at home in front of Susie and she doesn't like her outfit. So she makes herself a new blouse. She sews it on the fly and she follows Adam into a cafe. She is not wearing a bra under this blouse, by the way. Like she is ready to try to seduce this man and she's sipping coffee. They're outdoors at the cafe and she's watching Adam read while he's smoking a cigarette and he's resting his hand and he's resting his head on his hand. May stands up and crosses and passes him like, awkwardly seductively and like leans down on the counter to put sugar in her coffee. And it's, it's really hard to watch because she's not good at this at all, but she's putting herself out there and that's what we want her to do. You know, anyway, we're rooting for her. <laughs> it doesn't work. He does not notice her at all. Again, no one sees May. Uh, when she sits down, Adam, finally, he falls asleep and his head falls on the table, but his hand that he was resting it on is still up in the air. And May rises and she walks over to his table and she starts to caress his hand. And it's weird. And then she starts yeah. caressing her face, like nuzzling her face against his hand. And then she just rests her fucking head on his hand and he wakes up and he's confused. And he's Hi, like, hello. Who the hell are you? He doesn't freak out, right? He's a little bit like, what the hell's going on? And May stumbles back and then she falls on her ass. <laughs> it just makes everything worse. She doesn't say anything. She stands up and get, and walks away. It's so uncomfortable. It's so uncomfortable. But like been there, not the hand part, been there. <laughs> well, it's just like the inability to understand that that's not something that you should do, you know, or being so taken by his hands that she can't control herself. This is the thing about May. She fetishizes, she fetishizes parts of people, right? Yep. Polly's neck is beautiful. Adam's hands are beautiful. And that's what she fixates on about these people. Yeah. Now at work, May is pressing a scalpel into her thumb and drawing blood. And Polly sees it and she's shocked and a little obsessed. She what says, what are you doing? doing? <laughs> and May tells her she's relaxing. Polly says, doesn't it hurt? And May says, no. And she grabs Polly's hand and she jabs her thumb she starts like orgasming. Polly, first she goes, oh, you crazy bitch. <laughs> Why did you do that? But yeah, then she sucks her thumb. She's sucking her own blood. And then May looks she's instantly like, do me, and, do me again. <laughs> do me again. May looks ashamed. And then she's like, okay. Okay. <laughs> she does it again. This is 2002 when cutting was a real thing that was going on, you know? Yeah. And this movie doesn't yes. focus on it, but I do think it's really a sign of... I. I'm not in touch with young people. I don't know if it's something that's still going on, but when I was in high school, that was something that was really happening a lot. Yeah. She was like doing it so out in the open. We're like, yeah. But. So we cut to Anna Ferris enjoying getting her thumb cut to the dog leg that the owner brought in the missing dog leg. And he asked May if she can just sew it back on. And May says I could. Yeah. And that's it. Which is bizarre because you couldn't like the, the leg is already rotting. The, 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 it's not going to work. You can, you to be fair, you can sew it back on. You could sew it will back it, on, yeah. Will it work is another conversation. <laughs> exactly, yeah. She doesn't say I can, she says I could. Yeah. Cut to May at the laundromat and she looks very disheveled. Her hair is just up in two messy buns and she's got a top on that she's clearly made herself. It's got patches all over it. Adam enters and he walks over to the laundry machine directly next to hers and says, hello, uh, but he's out of detergent. And May looks over timidly and she says, you can use me. I mean, mine. And she's she's just like hard to watch. She, yep. Like also it was so quietly spoken that it could have been missed. Sure. It's like, I wonder if he even like 
heard that initial line, like she was very, very quiet with right. that. It's yeah. like, she knew she said it, so she was ashamed, but I don't know if he even like picked up. He also seemed high off his ass. So like, I don't even know if he, if he picked up on any of that. Oh, that's hysterical. <laughs> I didn't even consider he might be, he might be stoned. So like, that's talk- all I got from him. <laughs> that's hilarious. Uh, they're talking, they introduce themselves. May shakes his hand and she's fixated on touching his hand and he invites her to have a smoke with him outside. He lights her cigarette and it's very clear she's never smoked in her life, but she's doing this because he wants, you know, cause he invited her to. Mm-hmm. and he smirks a little bit like not in a mean way but just like okay you don't you know you don't smoke and uh, he asks her do you make your own clothes he tells her that's cool and she tells him that she loves his hands she thinks that they're beautiful and adam it's just this is an interesting he tells her that he used to be a hand model and she buys it she says i could see him i could see you doing that he tells her he's kidding and it's this kind of thing where we're getting to know that may absorbs what people tell her at face value She's very gullible. Very gullible and unable to differentiate between when someone is being real or honest and and misleading or even joking, you know? Yep. Now back at the dryers, May drops her panties on the ground and then she bends over awkwardly, seductively, like ass in his face to try to pick them up. And then she is staring at him and comments on his underwear in his basket. She says race cars because they're race car underwear. <laughs> And uh, he says his girlfriend bought them for him. And then on his way out, he clarifies that it was his ex-girlfriend that bought them. And he tosses his pack of cigarettes into her laundry basket, tells her to practice, says, I'll see you around. She looked so, when he said girlfriend, yeah, you saw a complete snap in her character there. Yeah. And it was almost, in a way, foreshadowing. Sure. But then he cleaned it up and clarified it to the ex. And I was like, that's... That was worth commenting on. Like it was that 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 one moment always like stuck out to me where it was, you know, you kind of saw where her intentions were. And yeah. like it wasn't super like friendship. It was like, no, she wants this, she wants this man for his hands, but she wants this man. Yeah. Uh she's so excited when she gets home, she's kind of talking to herself as though she's talking to him. It's it's just weird. I mean, I'm just gonna keep saying that she behaves strangely throughout. Um, and then she's yeah. smiling while she's looking at this pack of cigarettes that he gave her. And she tells Susie all about him and she falls asleep while holding this pack of cigarettes. Again, May times crossing the street at the same time as Adam and she purposely bumps into him this time. He tells her that she looks great and he invites her to share his lunch with him in the park. And so he cuts, he has a sandwich with him. He cuts it in half with a pocket knife and gives her half, which is really generous. Like half a sandwich is not super filling. He's sharing a sandwich with her. He said, he asks her what you do. And she says she works at the animal hospital and she sews. Some people think that's gross. He tells her, I love gross. Disgust me. And so she, she, it is a great line, but then she tells a story <laughs> It's, it's really gross. Really fucking gross. She tells the story of this old man who brought a dog in who was dying and begging them to save it. And it turned out that after an exam, the dog had a twisted bowel that needed to be removed immediately. So they shave this dog, Seymour. They shave Seymour's tummy, cut him open, and take out a piece of intestine about the size of a hot dog. Like the chili dog she was eating earlier? Exactly. I have to wonder if this <laughs> happened on the day that she was eating chili dogs. Like, did it make I her hungry? Did it make her hungry? It made her hungry. (laughs) Maybe, but- Oh, that's gross. Adam has a reaction to this, right? As he's eating his sandwich. And she says, everything went smoothly, but when they went to sew Seymour back up, they didn't have the heavy sutures for large dogs. So the doctor said if they tripled up on cat sutures, that would do the trick. And a few days later, the man calls up hysterical. The cat sutures had burst while he was at work. And by the time he got home, Seymour was sprawled out on the back porch with his guts all over the concrete and the fence all the way around was soaked in blood. It was a mess. It was so telling her say her her telling that story, smiling while continuing to eat. Yeah. Like, like that was so tell. That's why I believe that hot dog, like that, that, you know, theory. I believe that <laughs> it's like, maybe that was, maybe she's into that. I don't know. Without a doubt. Uh, you know, she smirks and says she had to sew that one back up. Adam lights a cigarette for her and she smokes it awkwardly. And he tells her, I guess your job takes a lot of guts. So his response to that 
is <laughs> is you know it's a warm response he's he is i think a little weirded out even for him but you know yeah he has a he has because a, he did ask for it he, he did, did say, disgust me so totally you know <laughs> Now, in the park, they see a group of blind kids from a, a local daycare center, and May notices one little girl specifically who wants to be al uh, left alone. She kind of shoves someone away from her. And then Adam quickly realizes, oh, shit, I got to go. He took the afternoon off to go see Argento's trauma at the Beverly. And May says, is that a movie? And he says, you've never seen trauma? Just a little what? bit bro -y. <laughs> It's a little bit like that snotty horror fan who's like, you don't know Argento. <laughs> super gatekeepy but we get this she tells him don't go and she grabs his hand and she's looking at his hand and uh he says he has to go but maybe they could see her again sometime and she instantly says tonight and they can't he can't but he says well maybe tomorrow night like but don't wait around for me like i'll call you we'll get together and then he sees her holding his hand and he goes like do you want to take them with you which is awkward because she does. May makes a new dress and she dances around in it for Susie, who is watching. It's really interesting. The way that they shot Susie is that it looks like she's watching May. Yeah. She is part of this scene. She is not alive, but she is not. All right. Here's my thing too. Do you wonder if there was a draft of the script where Susie might've talked to May or Susie might've moved at a point? And what would that movie have been like for you? An even more fucked up version of Child's Play. That's sure. what it would be. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I don't, I, I can't, I, I'd be intrigued about that, yeah. but I can't see it. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't have the same effect. I almost feel as if with the cracking of the glass, yeah. that was her communicating. Exactly. That's how, that's where, and I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. Um, I don't know if she was, if she would talk or move, that would be really and you're, like she was just a possessed dog. <laughs> right. I think that without talking or without a moment of moving, or even if it was just like a twitch or a turn of the head, it grounds us in more of a reality. Then there's less of a question of like, is May crazy or is this really happening? Or it's just a little bit more like, this is real. This is what's happening. I feel like that would turn it into a different film yeah. completely. Yeah. I think that Susie is alive to May. I don't think that Susie thinks that May is a living being, but I think that she has placed like um, agency on this doll where she mm -hmm. feels alive to her. And I think that's mm -hmm. communicated really well, exactly like you said, with the cracking glass throughout the film. Yeah. Uh, all right. So she takes this action figure that's wearing boxing gloves and she caresses its gloved hand on the face of a porcelain doll. She's playing with these dolls. And she seems to be listening to Susie describe something to her. And then she makes the two dolls kiss. And then she starts to kiss her own hand as though it's a mouth. And then she just looks at Susie and says, thanks for the advice doll. And she kisses the glass case. May and Adam are sitting in an old deconstructed car because he's a mechanic. They're eating chips and salsa. And Adam asks what she was doing to him that day at the coffee shop. She says she's so <laughs> embarrassed. She reveals she's never had a boyfriend before. Like, but she says it as a, like, I've never had a boyfriend before. So she's kind of assuming already that they're already boyfriend they're and girlfriend. Dating, yeah. yeah. Uh, Just Adam, from one, one comment. Adam reacts amusedly, a little confused, but he doesn't like shut it down. Right. You know, it's a, and this is where the argument of is Adam good, is Adam bad comes into play because I think he's very patient with her and I think that he's intrigued with her. I don't, and I think that he sees the weirdness and that he does like that. I don't think that he has malicious intent. I never, I never thought that. I never went in that direction. I can see people having that thought. Yes. I don't, I per se never saw him as a negative um, being. I thought he was genuine, like he was single. Yeah. He was genuinely interested, yeah. you know? You know, I always thought that she was cute. I don't think that she was, like, necessarily, like, a, you know what I mean? Like, I can see that being a, you know, he totally was interested. Yeah. And he was into the weirdness, and he was into whatever she was, like, <laughs> putting out there with the, you know, like, I just, I think that that was... um I just think he was freaked out in the end and he reacted appropriately. Yeah. Maybe not 
in the best way, but I do feel like when he ghosted, it was for a pretty logical reason. Yeah, for sure. Not that ghosting is okay, but like, I was like, I get it. Yeah. I get it. Um, Once again, ghosting's not cool. Don't do it. But like, you know. I, he's just complicated. And I, I, I appreciate that for sure. He may ask him if he likes her and he says, sure I do. And he dips a chip in the salsa, but she grabs onto his hand. And she's caressing his hand and staring at it. She says, do you, you don't think I'm weird? And he tells her, I do think you're weird. And she looks really dejected. And then he says, I like weird. I like weird a lot. Exactly. You know, and May puts his arm around her and nuzzles his hand. And she tells him he's perfect. He says, nobody is perfect. And she insists, well, you are. And then he says, you want to see my room? <laughs> Which and we may, sure did. may be where the fuck boy theory comes into play for people, I think. Uh, his bedroom is full of bizarre posters of horror imagery. I think he's got a, an Argento poster up somewhere. He's got weird he like does. knives and 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 blades and stuff hanging everywhere. So he would you would think be a suitable match for her because he's into weird shit too. Uh, May notices a knife on a shelf and uh, he tells her you're on to me and he takes it out of her hand and he says, I'm a psycho and he stabs her in the stomach, but it's a retractable knife. But the thing is, May doesn't even flinch. Like if that had been a real knife, she would have allowed him to penetrate her with it. And she's staring she him in the eyes. Accepted it. Yeah, she would have accepted it. Like she is madly in love with this guy. She doesn't even flinch. She takes his hand and uh, presses the retractable blade against her heart. So now we're really talking about penetration, like, you know, in the heart. Well, and then uh, she stabs it into his. And then they lean in and kiss. And this is May's first kiss. And she doesn't know what to do with her hands. They're kind of outstretched, flailing a little bit. And she's still holding that knife awkwardly. She wraps her arms around him and weirdly shoves him backwards really, really hard. And he says, Jesus Christ, who taught you how to kiss? And May's ashamed again. She looks, she does this looking down thing in shame. And she just goes, Susie. And we cut to May getting home and she walks up to Susie in the glass case and she goes, who taught you how to kiss? <laughs> and you sl she slams her fist on top of the glass and uh, display case and the case cracks. And it's not a funny moment. No. But it's kind of funny. She's just like, Susie, you fucked me. Like you taught me how to kiss wrong. <laughs> uh, but it's pretty upsetting. She actually cuts her hand on the case when she slams her fist down on it. And this is where we start getting the case becoming more and more cracked throughout. We hear, even after she's walked away from the case, we hear a cracking sound, which bleeds into the next shot, which is the next day. And May is sitting uh, at the animal hospital, kind of messing with a bandage on her hand. And she continues to hear glass cracking and looks around and there's nothing there, right? Uh, she's kind of horsing around or playing with the pack of cigarettes that Adam gave her and Polly enters holding a cat. And she asks what happened to May's hand and May says, Scoople. We, it's a little bit of a joke for May, you know, that uh, we don't expect. And Polly says she's funny. And she says, you want to watch me file? And um, so they go into the filing room where all the files are. Great pickup line. Yeah. <laughs> Polly tells her we got the whole place themselves and she says that we should dance and she turns on some music and the animals start barking and Polly insists they dance because the animals are now serenading them and then suggestively tosses the files on the floor and crawls up on the table. Oh my to God. Ask her to. Yeah. May dances with her and then Polly drops the line. Do you like pussy? And May reacts. and She goes, cats. Do you like pussy cats? You nasty girl. And, Polly's just this out of control, bizarre <laughs> reacher. Yes. <laughs> and then she asked you like Loopy. So Loopy is Polly's cat. She says, my landlady is a real bitch. I have to get rid of her. Your and landlady? May yes. May says the landlady. Like, no, Loopy. You're only <laughs> May. May's like, May's go-to is offing the landlady, you know? Yep. She chooses violence every time. She chooses violence. <laughs> She tells May that, May, you're all alone and the cat will remind you of me. And May says, okay. And then Polly immediately stops dancing with her and starts to leave the room. She says, she's got to go. It's girls' night. Want to come? I know you need your beauty rest. Not much of it, though. It's a moment where you have to question, was she doing all of this seductive, over-the-top dancing and being 
sexy and flirty just to get May to take her cat. Because as soon as May says yes, she she backs up, she shuts it down, you know? But then she walks out flirty as well. Even the invitation to come to girls' night, she doesn't even give May a chance to think about it, right? I know you need your beauty rest. But then she ends it with a flirt. Not much of it though. Like, how do you feel about this? I've met so many women like her. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> I've met so many. I'm like, I have like names coming to my, I'm like, oh my God, I've been there. Oh my goodness. I, I get like, kind of like people were saying with Adam, like fuck boy energy. I get like fuck girl energy out yeah. of her. Like I just, it's yes. I do think she was doing that for the cat. Yeah. I do think so. But she also fucks around I think she like sleeps around I I really do like because she has like ambrosia out of nowhere and she's got like that like I just think she I just think she's like that I yeah. think she's literally any character on the l word that is who she oh is. my god I love the l word like, like, <laughs> she funny. is Shane she is Shane 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 all day that's <laughs> that's a great point I think that she has a genuine interest in May it's just that May there's no in between between a friend and a lover or a friend and a romantic partner. There's no in between whatsoever for her, you know? And so she genuinely doesn't know what to do. And uh, sure. I think that she uses her sexuality to get May to take her cat, but I think there's something Literally. behind it. And I think Polly doesn't, I think Polly doesn't think twice about the way that she behaves. She doesn't see this as using May. I think. Uh, so I almost feel like she lives in a bubble. Polly. I feel like she almost lives in a bubble where she's like so fluid with her, like she's so like comfortable in her sexuality that she's gotten things out of it in her past that yeah. she just doesn't. I think that that's where I think she's, I don't think she realizes. Absolutely. That's, that's the thing. like, that's yeah. yeah. It's an interesting thought. <laughs> so we cut to May. She's at home. She calls Adam and he doesn't answer. I love his answering machine. Please leave a message after the scream. And then he screams, but God, this is the phone call we were talking about earlier. She's like, hello, May. Or she's like, hello, Adam. This is May. I was just wondering if you would like to be together, get together again. And she does that looking down ashamed thing. And there's these long pauses and the, we hear the glass cracking sound again. And Susie is watching this phone call happen. And May gives Adam her number and then tells him to call her anytime. And she goes to hang up and then she says, I look forward to seeing you again. And then she hangs up the phone and she just like leans over and watches the fucking phone, like waiting for him to call immediately. And the, the camera lingers on this for too long. <laughs> A really long time. <laughs> so uncomfortable. And then we get that song I love when he calls me kitten and we get a montage of her looking at her answering machine, doing laundry, looking for him. She like closes all the washing machines except the one directly next to her to make it look like they're all full except for the one directly next to her. And then we see her imagining Adam caressing her face. Again, answering machine, there's no phone. So we cut to Adam who goes to leave his house, but he's startled because May is actually standing outside his front door. He you says, how, her, yeah. how long have you been there? And she says, since about two. Literally like two. Yeah. You haven't really been standing there for two hours. And her response is, what do you think? <laughs> it's like, not yes, not no. <laughs> I think maybe more than two hours. <laughs> I think two being two is since two is modest for sure. Yeah. Uh, Adam says, you know, I got your message. I'm sorry. I haven't called you back. I've been really busy. I've been making a movie and may ask, can I see it? She says, I'll make you macaroni and cheese. So they go to her place and they're, she makes macaroni, like craft macaroni and cheese, and they're drinking Gatorade out of wine glass. <laughs> I, that was art. That was art. That art. touch was. Art. I love that he goes to take a sip, and then he smells it first. He's like, "What?" And, and okay. sips. He's like, is this lemon lime Gatorade? This Gatorade. <laughs> uh, so um, she she says, "You'll never believe what I had to do at work today." And he's about to take a bite. And then he puts his fork down. <laughs> He's like, I know what's coming. Nope. Another we're, we're gross story. We don't hear the story. We cut to them sitting on a couch together and his movie is on. And the movie is a black and white, very much student film, very much yes. film school, you know, art house fair. And it's called Jack and Jill. And it's a woman and a man canoodling in a park on a picnic. So this couple was actually in Lucky's first film. It was a short called All Cheerle Cheerleaders Die, which he mm -hmm. then remade later on a few uh 2016 i think anyway 
this couple is canoodling, uh, they're drinking wine, and we hear the song, My Baby Does the Hanky Panky. The couple in the film starts kissing, and then the woman puts his finger in his mouth, in her mouth and bites it off, and blood squirts on his face, uh, on her face, almost like ejaculatory a little bit. And what we descend into is the couple beginning to eat each other seductively. <laughs> It's it's erotic cannibalism. May Scooch is closer to Adam. She's really enjoying the movie. And this couple just starts eating each other while they're having sex. A fun fact about that film. Yeah. The guy in the film is Jesse Lubick, who was the her co-doctor in Sick Girl. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like wow. once again, goes into that like group collaboration that yes. like they always work together. I love that shit. Like I yeah. thought that was so cute. Well, I also love at the end of his film, his credit is Regia D. Adam Stubbs. He's such a fucking Argento <laughs> nerd that he puts <laughs> Regia D. Like, like, it, like it's a fucking Italian horror movie. Pretentious asshole. <laughs> Ruins everything with Stubbs. Yes, Stubbs. <laughs> that last name. <laughs> he asks her, what did you think? And she says, it was sweet. But she offers this critique that she didn't think that he that she could bite his whole finger off in one bite. That part was far fetched. <laughs> and we cut to Adam and May making out on on the bed, and she like goes to bite his finger and then thinks about it again. But then she doesn't. Again, she doesn't know what to do with her hands. They're kind of flailing around awkwardly. She's like afraid to touch him, maybe. Mm -hmm. And she starts to go a little overboard with the kissing. And Adam tells her, "Calm down and breathe." He takes off his shirt, he unbuttons her dress, and then May bites him on the lip really fucking hard. He pulls away and he looks at Susie. He says, what the fuck is that? And then he realizes his mouth is bleeding a lot, like real bad. And May takes his blood and she starts rubbing it on her face and her neck. And then she grabs his finger and starts to put it in her mouth again. And he pulls away and... you know, he, he starts to realize like, oh, this is fucking weird. He's like, I'm yeah. gonna leave. I'll see you around, right? And her response is, but it's just like your movie. It's again, like, all right, here, my question to you, do you think that she was actually into this? Or do you think that she felt like he was because she watched that movie that he made? I feel like she just doesn't know what's normal. Yeah. And she's trying so hard to be normal. And she he made that film and it almost was like an erotic thing. Yeah. Um, and she was like, oh, this must be normal to him. Right. So let me do this to him. Like, it, I don't think it was like, oh, I find, I don't think she was like, oh, I find this hot. Like, I just think, I think she was just trying to be what he wants. Yeah. Like, I think she was trying so hard to please him. Yeah. And he, as he tells, a person, so yeah, that's what it was. He tells her, May, this is weird. And she says, You like weird. He tells her, Not that weird. And he leaves. And Susie's, Susie's watching all of this happen. And when he closes the door behind him out, outside of her apartment, we hear the glass crack again. And then she screams, I told you to face the goddamn wall. And he hears it. And he's like, Absolutely not. Who the fuck is she screaming? Absolutely at? not. <laughs> Absolutely not. And we hear more glass cracking. I love just the Foley sound of this crunchy glass cracking yeah. is really effective. It's not over the top. It's really light. Uh, the cracking so as she's opening the sutures on yeah. that animal. Yeah. That comes next. I think. Uh, like yes, that, it does. Yeah. That mixing, that mixing was beautiful. I, I, it was like super unsettling. Yeah makes you cringe well because like if the cracking glass is her coming undone then while she's opening this animal up it's tying this um surgical procedure to her coming undone yep um all right so may knocks on she goes to knock on his door she's about to knock and then we hear adam's roommate he's doing crunches inside and he tells adam take your cigarette outside i'm don't smoke in here. So he opens the door a crack and he puts his hand with the cigarette in it outside. So the smoke blows outside and it's right in her face. And he doesn't know that she's there, but his beautiful hand that she's obsessed with, that the cigarette in it that she's picked up smoking from him is right in her face. And we hear a conversation. 
The roommate says, so what do you think, man? And Adam says, I don't know. She's pretty, but I don't think she's playing with a full deck. The roommate says, at least you know she's not out of her mind. And so May thinks that he's talking about her. And she gets excited when she says she's beautiful. And then Adam's response is, we're not talking about May anymore. I successfully escaped that lunatic. And she Ooh. breaks, breaks down. It's interesting because if Susie is on the other side of glass and May is can't get to him, get to her, now Adam is on the other side of a door and May can't get to him. You know, yeah. there's that barrier between her and any any creature that she tries to love yeah a female voice from inside says who's may and may covers her mouth about like on the verge of tears and adam adam's roommate says some weird chick adam just dumped and she's destroyed and he's he jokes and says how's your lip so what she liked your hands just keep them away from your face and may goes home and she cuts one of the boxing gloves off of that action figure that she was practicing kissing with. And she rubs the glove against her face. And she gets a phone call from Polly that goes to voicemail. And Polly's just wondering how her little puss puss is. And she tells her to come over if she gets this message. I call my cat puss puss because of this movie. <laughs> um, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so a plus. A plus. May goes to Polly's house and Polly's actually eating a melon. <laughs> see, see, we knew, we knew, we know what that means. We know yeah, what that means. Yeah, all right. Uh, <laughs> May is holding Adam's cigarettes and she puts one in her mouth and Polly removes it with her mouth and spits it out and kisses May. And she tells her, I've wanted to kiss you since I first saw you. She starts to unbutton May's dress and the song, When He Calls Me Kitten, plays again. The song acts as a conduit for her emotions towards somebody, her longing. Polly asks if May feels weird doing this, and May just says, I am weird. And Polly says, I love weird. And May says, are you serious about me? And Polly says, dead. So May responds to this intimacy by touching Polly's neck and kissing her neck. She loves her neck. Uh, Polly goes down on her, and May notices a giant mole on Polly's finger, and she's fascinated and she's turned off by it. Yep. I found it so interesting, like as a character study for May in general, like I think that it's so interesting when she's communicating to these people that she's into, um, she talks direct, I don't know if you've noticed, she talks directly to the parts. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like she was talking directly to Adam's hands saying, yes. don't go. She was talking directly to her neck. Like, are you like, it's very interesting. It's like, what do you think of that? Like, that's just, it's so bizarre. That's exactly what it is. She fetishizes pieces of people and she will come to a, a, a realization about that pretty soon, you know? But what I'm really curious about yeah. is her queerness, right? It's, it's again, Lucky McKee yeah. writes a lot of, of, lesbian relationships do we feel like may is bisexual or do we feel like may responds to anyone who's showing interest in her i feel like it's more the second thing i would go even to say like she's pan like i would just i think she literally like any any anybody mm -hmm. any person yeah that or, or maybe you know, even like, like demi doesn't... like demisexual right where she responds to intimacy i mean yeah I just, I feel like anybody that is willing to talk to her and spend time with her, she immediately jumps down. I don't think she sees the gender or any of that. I don't think that yeah. that matters at all to her at all. Yeah. I just, cause she, you know, like I, it's, it's a, that's a bigger conversation. Like, I don't know. I'm not sure. Like it could be either one, but I don't think that it's, I don't, I wouldn't go. I wouldn't say that she's like, bye. I think it's closer to like pan. Yeah. yeah she wants anyone to see her. anybody. And that's what she's going to respond to. I do think that this, this scene is filmed really well. It does not feel as male gazy as it might coming from a male, a male director. Yes. I think it's really soft. I think it's really forward but not gratuitous. Um, and it's a, it's a very beautiful scene. I think it was done with love. Yeah. And care. 
Uh, but so she sees this mole on her finger. She's turned off by it. Now we cut to May smoking in the park, watching these blind kids again from the daycare center. And she notices that loner girl again, and she ends up going to the to the daycare. And I love the receptionist says, can you help us with something? She's this like bitchy goth girl who actually auditioned for the role of Polly. The guy who played Adam's roommate auditioned to play Adam. And this girl who plays the receptionist at the daycare auditioned to play Polly. Why would you hire this like, unfriendly, mean, bitchy person to work at a daycare. Anyway, May, inqu <laughs> May inquires about the kids in the park and asks if she can volunteer to help watch them. Uh, and the receptionist says, well, she's really mean. She's like, did you see the arslers? Did you see the blind kids? Did you see the handy, like that? She's using these really awful terms for these disabilities. Yeah. And uh, May spe specifies it was the blind kids, but she wants to be, she wants to watch these particular blind children. And she's introduced to the kids. Specifically, she wants to meet the loner girl whose name turns out to be Petey. And the 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 teacher actually tells her Petey usually likes to be left alone. And May remarks, nobody likes to be alone. Petey is making out of clay an ashtray. She hands May some clay. They have a brief conversation. I love May says, do you smoke? And it's like, she's serious about it. And PD says, no, but you do. And you can have this ashtray when I'm done. Right. Or actually PD asks, do you smoke? And May's response is, yes, I do. And it's almost proud. It's a little bit like, yeah, I do this thing. I do this. I smoke. I'm into it. You know, PD tells you, you can have it when I'm done. Now we cut to May at the laundromat and Adam comes in and it's fucking weird and uncomfortable. Chris. He could have just walked out or he could have just completely ignored her. But he says, how are you doing? She says, she's great, making new friends left and right. And she introduces Loopy, her cat, who's in the laundry basket. Uh, and it, it's a little strange. And Ab, he, he just pretends that his washing machine is broken and he leaves. And she's like, call me some time. Sure, I'll see you around May. She goes to that washing machine and puts quarters in it and starts it. And it turns out it's not broken. And she's super it's sad. Fun. May knocks on Polly's door. Polly answers wearing a kimono and a female voice from inside says, who is it, Polly? May asks, who is it? And Polly explains it's an opportunity that she just couldn't pass up and invites May to join them. But May declines. And, uh, you know, then I'll see you tomorrow. I just, I gotta hit this. You're jealous. And we see a pair of sexy legs kicking behind, uh, like through a doorway behind Polly. He ordered the house salad. <laughs> and uh, May is really hurt. And Polly says, I, you know, I can kick her out if you want to, but I don't think Polly means it, you know? Um, you know, you're my main mama. And May places Polly's arm up against the door so that door frame so that her kimono blocks the legs so she, she doesn't look at them anymore. And she leaves really upset. Right. Now we see Susie's case and it's cracked a lot, lot more. And we hear these cracking sounds as May cries on the floor. She's surrounded by doll parts and she lights a cigarette and uses the uh, ashtray that Petey made her. She tries to call Loopy the cat over to her, but the cat is unresponsive. Frankly, May should have gotten a dog because they're always excited to see you. This cat doesn't want to see her. It actually hisses and walks away and May is crying and she stands up and she chucks awesome. the <laughs> ashtray at the cat and she kills the fucking cat. <laughs> Damn, it was a sharp ashtray. She does it out of <laughs> anger. She didn't mean to. This is this is the moment where we the snapping is really starting to happen, you know, and it's it's a sad sad little image of the the cat's legs behind it, like peeking peeking out behind a door. I just realized almost almost like Ambrosia's legs peeking out behind that door as well. Yep. I wonder if there's a parallel there. Um, nothing lucky, probably. Yeah, but. She's killed her cat. Now we hear more glass breaking. May is like crouched in the shower, holding the phone, uh, about to make a phone call. And she yells, shut up, it's Susie. Uh, and the, the sound of glass stops. She says, thank you. And she calls Adam. She's excited to hear his voice. The dead bloody cat is at her feet with her in the shower now. And she asks Adam, uh, what are you doing tonight? The glass keeps cracking. He says, why? Uh, and then he says, you know, I have plans. And she screams quiet at Susie again while she's on the phone with him. It's super cringe. And so who are you talking to? She doesn't respond. You know, she says, how about tomorrow night? And he's deflective. He says he has to go. 
And she's like, I'll call you tomorrow then. We hear more glass cracking. And now there are missing chunks from glass of glass on the case. And May covers her ears and screams and cries and hangs up the phone. And she opens up the closet door where she's apparently keeping Susie now. And she just screams, I hate you. So May's lost her fucking mind. <laughs> we cut to these blind kids in class and she has brought a surprise for them all and invites the kids to feel the case, uh, which is much less cracked than it was before. Which goes into the theory of that's how she's communicating. Like it's all in her head. Yes, absolutely. Like that's where, yeah. Still cracks, but nothing like it was, you know, just now. Like it was, yeah. She tells the kids that she's brought her best friend and I didn't even realize it was my best friend until last night. And Petey tells May to take the doll out of the case. And May says she can't, she's special. And the kids start swarming around her and taking the case from her. And the case falls to the floor and shatters and there's glass everywhere on the floor. Steph, how do you feel about this scene? Because I go a little back and forth about it. These kids are crawling around on broken glass. They start crying. There's blood on the floor. Kids, bloody hands and oh, the knees really get me. And May is freaking out. And instead of helping these children, she scoops up Susie, the doll, and holds her close to her. She's worried about the doll, not the kids. And May has glass on her hands and she rubs her eyes. And now she's rubbed glass into her eyes. What is going on here? I'm literally cringing in my seat thinking about it. And I, it's that scene has always been really haunting. Yeah. Um, just her scooping the doll up while you just hear screaming Yeah. in the background by children. It's like, that has always been a really dark image. Yeah. I would argue one of the most fucked up scenes in the whole movie oh for sure i don't really fully know what she was going for with going and meeting these children yeah if she was trying to be fulfilled in some way ventured over there and they were giving her some kind of attention or she saw herself in them or i there are a million different ways to decipher what was going on there but her bringing the doll and the glass and all of that, like, it was just like, why, why, you know? Yeah. It was just such a bad decision, bad choice. I don't even, well, it's, it's, it's like still like, I'm still cringing about thinking about it. Like it's, it was, it was haunting. If eyesight is such a big motif in this film and seeing May wanting someone to see her, is such a big motif. These children can't see, but they they use their hands to to get a grasp of things, right? And yes. they they feel things. And she brought something that's inside of a case. They will never grasp what is inside of this case. They can only grasp the exterior. And I have to wonder if there's a little bit of of this is May still trying to show who she is. But even these kids can't see who she is because who she is is this doll and this doll is behind glass. And then when the glass is shattered and herself, this is when she exposes herself, right? Now she is exposed and she scoops the doll up. Yes. And now the doll is no longer in a case. And I think this is the turning point for her where, you know, she's already killed a cat, but this is where everything, she's a completely different person after this experience. Completely. She gets home. And she's holding pieces of Susie the doll. She tries to piece Susie back together in her apartment. She can't seem to. And she's just carrying her dead cat around with a bottle of Lysol. And she's just kind of stumbling around. Her eyes are irritated and bugging her. And she starts rubbing them, which is making it worse because she has glass in her eyes. She's rubbing them. She starts scratching them really, really, really hard, yeah. like, like clawing at them. And instead of the screen fading to black, the screen fades to red and that makes what's happening so much worse <laughs> yes. because it's like the, her vision is turned, you know, filled with blood. Yeah. Oh God. Phone rings and it goes to voicemail and May is on her bed with a, the, the torso of a doll on top of her eyes. Polly leaves a voicemail asking where she is. And the doctor is mad that she's missed a couple days of work. May stands up out of bed and the dead cat falls to the ground. She walks across the room, like stumbles to the mirror and looks into the mirror and her eyes look 
fucking gross. Just scratched to hell. Claw marks on her face. Yeah. Her eyeballs are bloody. She leans down to pet the dead cat. And then she sprays it with the Lysol. And she remarks, oh, Loopy, I'll miss petting your pretty fur. Now, this is going to come back to something that I only noticed this week when I watched this movie for the millionth time. Uh, but she does fetishize pieces of people, right? Yes. Yeah. The fur is what she appreciated about Loopy. Now, we cut to May sitting on a bus bench and her face is fine. Like, there's no more scratches. A lot of, you know, it, it, a lot of people assume that time has passed, but we have to remember we are in the, the confines of the Halloween season. Right, because Polly is yeah. carving a pumpkin at the beginning, and this movie's climax is on Halloween night. So, if her face is fine this quickly, then did any of that really happen, or is this in her head, or beyond that? Based on the climax, the ending of this movie, is this like a sense of magical realism of not just her imagining it, but her going through it? I just think she's Wolverine. <laughs> She just regenerates. No, I, no, I, I, there are so many different layers that like, I think that it's a majority of the things happening to her are in her psyche. Like, I think yeah. she's, I think she's imagining so much of it. Yeah. And it leaves, Lucky leaves so many things in this film for the audience to figure out and yes. for the audience to like, and I, I, I kind of like that. Yeah. I don't know. I, there's no really any way of knowing like it's with the confines of this, of the Halloween season. It's pretty, so it's a pretty solid theory that she wasn't actually that hurt. Yeah. Like, I don't think she was really hurt in that moment well then you also have to ask did anything happen at the school did the kids crawl around in the glass we just don't know but i do think that the the scratching of the eyes did not happen actually i think that that's her i don't think that happened at all in her mania alone in her apartment so she's sitting on this bus bench her eyes look normal now and this punk sits next to her and he asks if she's okay this kid is fucking crazy he comes off as normal at first she's the hair uh watching people the walk hair. she's watching people walk past uh oh. past her back and forth and she is she looks very sad and she just remarks so many pretty parts no pretty holes it's almost a realization to her the punk asks her name and she says it, it doesn't matter he scooches closer and he says do you want to go get some jujubes with me <laughs> so specific she just says, what's the point? He's like, I'm just trying to be friendly. Sorry. So we cut to the punk eating jujubes in May's apartment. It's the worst candy. <laughs> now that he is in her home, he goes from being friendly to being fucking weird. And he says, oh, it's hella hot. You mind if I take my shirt off? She says, do what you want. And he <laughs> takes his shirt off and reveals an arm tattoo of Frankenstein's monster on his shoulder. And May says, I love your tattoo. He says, thanks. And he flexes it. He goes, fuck, I'm still burning up. Do you have any ice cubes I can rub on my nipples? What? <laughs> what? He crosses to the freezer and May can't stop him in time before he opens the freezer and he sees Loopy, the cat wrapped in plastic wrap. And he's like, what the hell the is that? Is that? <laughs> she says, a friend. And she asked him, are we going to be best friends now that you've seen what's in my freezer? And he calls her a freak and he says, no, I'm not going to be your fucking friend. And May again looks heartbroken and she starts to yeah. cry. Like she's crying. And here's what is brilliant about the writing and the performance is that this is ludicrous. This is terrible behavior. She should not be doing any of this, but God damn it. I feel so sorry for her. Oh my gosh. Like she just wants a friend and it's hard to convey without watching the film how heartbreaking this is, but he backs away and she snaps and she grabs a pair of scissors, which is very telling because she sews, she cuts with these scissors. Her mom was a crafter, so she used these scissors, right? And she rushes toward him and he puts his hand up in defense. She stabs the scissors through his hand and then nails his hand up into his skull. And it's such a cool kill. Never seen it before. Really, really liked it. But she has she has a breakdown. And uh, we cut to May smoking a cigarette and she's thinking of Adam and his hands. She's thinking of kissing Polly. Uh, she 
picture is the cat and then just that dog leg. Uh, and then you know, she sees herself cutting the boxing glove off of the action figure. And as she smokes a cigarette, she comes to a realization and she says, I need, I more, need parts. more parts. And this is where the movie becomes a fucking horror movie. <laughs> That's where it becomes body horror. Yes, yes. So May is smoking in the park under a tree, reading a book, just like Adam used to. And uh, he approaches and he says, what is she reading about? And May says, amputation. And it's weird. And he's like, is that for work? And she goes, no, just for fun. Just for Adam crouches down next to her and he says he's sorry things didn't work out between them. It just didn't feel right. It still doesn't. And May says, I understand now. She's tapping her head with her she finger. She calls him dude at some point too. Yeah. She's she's, <laughs> uh, she's moved on. Yeah. Completely. Of, in a in a weird way, right? She's she's not interested. She's a completely in different person. She has snapped. She has cracked. She yes. is not the same. She has realized she doesn't give a fuck about Adam. She loves Adam's hands. Yep. And he puts his hand out to shake hers and he says, friends, and she takes it. And then she starts caressing the hand and then she kisses it. And Adam's weird out and says he has to go. And May waves goodbye to his hands and says, later hands. Yep. And Adam walks away. We cut to May measuring Polly's neck with a tape measure. She this tells whole her, scene. It's so good. She tells Polly's like, what are you doing? I'm going to make you a blouse. It's an apology for the way I acted the other night. And Polly asks, how is Loopy? And May says, in pieces. Yeah. <laughs> Polly thinks that means the cat is sad or depressed. And then Polly's girlfriend, Ambrosia, approaches. And she's wearing a very Alex. revealing skirt that showcases her gorgeous legs. And uh, Polly introduces her and May remarks, nice gams. And, gams. Uh, May takes more measurements. She asks if Polly uh, ever thought about having that mole on her finger removed. And Polly, like just looks at it almost like she's never considered it. She's like, well, my grandma told me that imperfections are what make us special. What? What do you think? And May just walks away. <laughs> uh, Ambrosia calls her a freak behind her back. Now May steals surgical tools from the animal hospital and she buys a rolling ice chest from a hardware store. And we see her putting on makeup. It's Halloween night. She's made a Halloween costume. Of? Well, it, the big reveal comes after she calls Polly, leaves her another voicemail and says, she's bringing over the new blouse and I want to show you my Halloween costume. She speaks in a deeper voice now. Yes. Almost sultry. Uh, and she speaks with confidence. And then we get this great reveal that her costume is Susie the doll. And she's replicated the red dress. She's added really cool embellishments. It's a great costume. I really wish people would cosplay May with the, the bloody ice cooler at horror cons. I got you next year. I, I got you next year. I'll try it. Great. <laughs> Great, please do. <laughs> but you open, like the door is like open of the elevator and you hear like a voiceover that she's just like, if you can't find a friend, make, make one. one. And that is poetic. It's what her mom told oh her. God. It's words to live by. This is now <laughs> May's mantra, right? I can't find Absolutely. someone, so I'm going to make someone. She shows up at Polly's house. Uh, Polly lets her in and May reaches toward her neck when Polly's not looking and... Uh, Polly takes her top off and she asks if May is still mad and she explains it's just a piece of ass and May pulls out two scalpels and begins to caress Polly's neck with them and Polly thinks it's a sexy game right because she kind of uh -oh. got off on she got uh -oh. off on yeah <laughs> whoa it's her whoa. face so good <laughs> and May has the two scalpel scalpels on either side of her neck and Polly looks up at her and she says I know you would never hurt me May and right after she says that, May slits her throat with the two scalpels. And it's this great moment. Polly is silently gasping for air, but it's a little bit like, I know you would never hurt me. She underestimates. She takes advantage of May, right? It's not that she trusts May. It's that she underestimates May. And there's a huge, mm -hmm. huge difference. And it's a moment when May is like, yeah, well... I'm not, I don't give a fuck about you. I'm here for the neck. I'm here for the neck. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ambrosia gets home drunk. She's drinking milk out of a carton, which I just realized is something that happens in All Cheerleaders Die. I wonder if that's another Lucky McKee thing. Uh, she asks May what she's doing here and she's snarky and bitchy and being belittling and she mocks her and May's like, you have really nice legs. And 
give us a little spin, turn around for me. Ambrasia tells her, you're so fucking weird. I don't see what Polly sees in you. And May's response is, Polly doesn't see anything. Yep. Ambrasia spins around and May jabs the scalpels into either side of her temples. The coolest kill in the film, I will say that that shot of the milk yes. mixing with the blood. Yes. Just so good. Fucking I, it's gorgeous. Always stood out. And it's it, always stood out. It lingers, right? Yeah. It ling it's a little too long. Yep. So now May is walking home. She's pulling her rolling ice chest behind her. The, the ice chest has blood all over it. Someone walks past wearing, she's a zombie cheerleader. She is dressed as one of the characters in All Cheerleaders Die, which was his first short film that he remade. Um, and the, the the cheerleader says, sweet costume. Got any cold ones in there? And May's response yep. is, yes, I do. <laughs> sure do. He didn't specify what ones were. So right, yeah. <laughs> right. So now May, May knocks on Adam's door, who answers it. And he's dressed as like Julius Caesar, which I think is really interesting because he gets stabbed yeah. in the back, right? There's penetration there. Uh, he has to wave his hands in May's face to get her attention. And she just says, I need them, Adam. Her eyes like follow his hand, which yes. I thought was. Adam yeah, does not exist anymore. It's all about the hands. All about the hands. A girl says, listen, sister, he's taken tonight. But I love this interaction. May tells her, I like your earrings. And the girl says, oh, thanks. Nice costume. Like that just disarms her. <laughs> I like your earrings. Oh, thanks. Adam says, what are you doing here, May? And the girl says, so this is May? You want to come in? Why don't you come in for a drink? Like, I <laughs> I have to see this. And he tells her, you should have called. May says, would you have answered? Facts. Yes, if I was home, right? Facts. Total facts. No, he wouldn't have fucking answered. No, he wouldn't. She says, I, it doesn't matter. I didn't come here to see you. And he, he's thumbing his retractable knife. Uh, and May asks, uh, he asks May if something happened. And she says, touch me. Touch my face. And Adam's new girlfriend laughs and sits in his lap. She's wearing cat ears as a Halloween costume, which speaks volumes of who the fuck she is. Like, that is yeah. as basic as basic can be, right? <laughs> and she tells her, his hands are mine now, mine now, honey. And she bites his finger, reminiscent of what happens in the erotic cannibalism film that he made. Big mistake. Huge. Right. Huge. <laughs> May asks Adam again to touch her face and uh, his his girlfriend says go ahead and she drunkenly falls on the floor. She reaches up for Adam and he doesn't help her but May does. May helps her stand up and May says touch my face and he, he says fine and he goes to poke it with his finger and she jabs the scalpel into the girl's neck and Adam screams while blood spurts onto his face and we cut to May wheeling the ice chest into her apartment and she pulls Adam's hands out. She says, you're going to look perfect. And now we cut back to a montage of May jabbing the scalpel into Adam's stomach. That's where he stabbed her with the retractable knife initially. Yep. Uh, and May runs a bath and disrobes and we see her scrubbing what we think is her leg, but it turns out to be one of Ambrose's severed legs. She dresses, and she puts on her glasses, no more contacts. She works diligently with her various medical tools. There are doll parts strewn about the floor, flashes of fabric flying through the air across the screen. Nice shot. It's Love great. That shot. It's 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 great. It's reminiscent of the doll parts falling in front of the screen at the beginning of the film. This all happens while May is sewing together a, a garment made out of cloth, which she then sews onto hands and limbs. And this is what I noticed for the first time this week. She's she has Loopy's fur. She has skinned the cat and is yep. integrating the cat fur into what she's creating. And I never picked up on that before. So when she tells Loopy, I'm going to miss petting your fur. Oh, you have fetish. That's what you like about this cat. Yep. She sews what looks like a rudimentary head onto Polly's neck. So the head is made of cloth onto Polly's neck. And she takes pieces of the broken ashtray that spell out M-A-Y. PD had, had put her name on the ashtray. And she rearranges the letters until it spells out A-M-Y, Amy. In French, the word friend is Ami, A-M-I. I think there's oh. something there. But I also think that Amy was perhaps the name of Lucky's mother who passed away, if I'm not mistaken. So a little, oh. a little tribute there. May puts the now empty pack of Adam's cigarettes into the breast pocket. And then she regards her creation. And we see the punk's arms 
and Ambrosia's legs and Polly's neck and Adam's hands with a patchwork torso and a patchwork head and bits of Loopy's fur here and there. And she places Susie's broken blue eyes on the head and May is ecstatic. Mm -hmm. She realizes that this new friend, Amy, can't see her. And she gets worried. You can't see me. She puts her glass, she takes her glasses off and her lazy eye gets lazy again. And she puts the glasses on Amy. She says, you can't see me. And now May begins to cry. And she removes yep. one of Susie's eyes from the head. And she looks in the mirror at her lazy eye, sits down in front of the mirror, and she grabs a pair of scissors. And crying, she jams the scissors into her eye, the lazy one, and cuts it out. And this is the opening shot that we had at the very beginning of the movie of her holding her bloody eye, screaming. Screaming. Yeah. She pulls the eye from its socket, and places it on Amy's head. And this is where my heart breaks. She's screaming, see me, like see me all I want, see me. And she's weeping. I mean, this is like, this is a crying scene if I've ever seen one before. Yeah. And she caresses Amy's face and she's wailing and sobbing. And then we see May's eyeball fall off of Amy and may is cuddled up next to amy and amy's hand which is adam's hand connected to the punk's arm rises up and reaches to may's head and strokes her face gently and may begins to smile and she calms down and the film is over and it's really fucking hard to sit through. Yep. It, it's hard to sit with that after that after that ending. Yeah. Now it's one of those films that you're sitting for a minute afterwards in the dark. And you're like, what did I, what just happened? Yeah. You are left in this film feeling empty and devastated and frightened and very confused. And you have to put together, you know, yep. it's it comes down to this is the fact. The Amy May's creation did not actually reach up and stroke her. This is the magical realism exponent. This is her psyche. This is in her head. And it's heartbreaking because finally, finally, someone gives her affection. But someone she had, sees her. Someone sees her. And fuck, is it just sad. I mean, there's nothing else to be said. I think this ending really made a lot of viewers mad again this movie did not do well in in theaters and um no. and it open ended endings like this just generally don't fare well you know with with general audiences it's a very specific moviegoer who's going to appreciate this film on Rick or treat horror cast we have a rating system a movie is either a trick which means it's all right or it's a treat which means you loved it or it's a smell my feet which means it sucked i think i already know your answer but go ahead <laughs> I mean, absolutely a treat. It's one of the, once again, like in my top five horror films I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. I'm already like literally just hearing the whole film spoken back to me. I'm feeling what I felt watching it. So yeah. <laughs> it's, um, I feel that like emptiness literally right now that I'm like, oh my God, like it's just breaks your heart in a million pieces emphasis on pieces uh but sure. <laughs> it's it's just it, it's uh it's it's a wild ride i yeah. i want to know what is your rating it's i mean clearly a treat it's uh, you know among my absolute absolute top favorites it breaks me every time that i watch it it's a movie that my friend brian the guest last week described some movies as top shelf horror in that almost like a top shelf liquor cabinet, you don't always reach for the best. You know, you kind of save it for a specific moment. And that's how I feel about this movie. I I can't watch it over and over and over again. It has to be with purpose that I sit down and watch this, you know? A is a nice bottle of Johnny Walker Blue. Okay. Yeah, for sure. It's a hell of a movie, hell of a performance. Again, it in, it instilled in me an appreciation for independent film. I think it was very formative for me in like my mid teen years to discover this film. And I absolutely love it. And that's what I have to say about May. Steph, I can't thank you enough 
for being on the podcast. Truly. You were the perfect guest for this film. It's been on my list of movies and people I've had a couple guests like actively decline talking about it. And I understand this was a hard one because it's a lot of dialogue. It's a lot of non-action going on. Listen, where can my listeners stalk you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at NYC Scream Queen, um, where I post a lot of stories of uh, me rating horror films. That's that's pretty much all I do. <laughs> So uh, it is a massive passion of mine. I am a diehard horror film fan. Hell yeah. You're an amazing uh, social media friend and you're an amazing real in life friend as well. And I, again, I'm so grateful to have you on the podcast. Uh, if you want to follow Rick or Treat on Instagram, TikTok, and X, I am at Rick or Treat Pod. And my YouTube channel is Rick or Treat Horror Cast. Again, thank you, Steph. Thank you, listeners. And we'll see y'all later, spookies. Thanks for coming, Rick or Treating. It'd be a real scream if you'd take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review the show on whatever platform you're listening on. The show's spooky intro and outro music is a cover of Camille Saint Sans's Danse Macabre with orchestrations composed and performed by Lestat von Monlicht. My website, rickertreat.com, is designed and maintained by Evelyn DeVere. The show's social media content is created by my evil minion and social media manager, Stanley Martin. The Rick or Treat logo was designed by Philip Romano. Contact information and links to these artists can be found in the episode description. Check them out, they're frighteningly talented. Rick or Treat Horrorcast is independently produced by me, Ricky J. Duarte, of Rick or Treat Productions. If you like what you heard, tell a fiend. I mean, friend. If you didn't, well, they're coming to get you, listener. <laughs>